Okay, hello everyone. Um, so, uh, there's basically two things I want to talk about today. Um, one is, generally speaking, what Hobbes says about law, what a law is, and um, some other things that come up in connection with that. And the other is um, um, how should I put this? Yeah. How is the sovereign limited by law? So, I mean, the short answer to how is the sovereign limited by law is that the sovereign is not subject to the civil law, but is subject to the divine law or the law of nature, which are supposed to be the same thing, but we'll have to talk about that a little bit. Um, so, um, so part of what I'm going to talk about when I talk about this is the divine law and what that means, although there's going to be more to say about that next time when he finishes saying uh, everything he wants to about divine laws. Um, but also in the course of this, because um, this is the area in which the puzzle comes up, uh, I'm going to uh, get to some of the things about economics and the distribution of property that I was hoping to do last time and I didn't get to. So I'm gonna that's going to be pushed into here. But first, I'm just going to talk about this about what Hobbes says about law in general, and I guess I should say the civil law in particular. So um, okay, so. Hobbes has a definition of law, of course. It's very important to have a definition, as usual, because everything that we can know with certainty by means of science about law is going to be derived from the definition. Um, so... Um, This is in chapter 16, paragraph 2. Uh, and first, it is manifest that law in general is not counsel but command, nor a command of any man to any man, but only of him whose command is addressed to one formerly obliged to obey him. Formerly, he means like already, I think, obliged to obey him. And as for civil law, it addeth only the name of the person commanding, which is the persona civitatis, the person of the commonwealth. So this is a definition of law and a definition of civil law, right? That is, when you put all these things together, law is a command by someone to someone who's obliged to obey them. And it's a civil law if the command is from the commonwealth. Um, so, um, so I want to note, first of all, that this definition of law doesn't mention punishment. Right? And the law is a command to someone obliged to obey. It doesn't mention that um, the person giving the command is going to punish you if you don't follow it. 
Um, now, that's, I mean, one reason I'm calling attention to that is because when Locke defines law, it's, the definition is going to be in terms of punishment and reward, but it's usually punishment, right? Uh, so at least in the case of human laws, it's usually punishment, right? Divine laws are supposed to, supposedly enforced by reward and punishment, but... Um, So, um, but another reason to emphasize this is because actually, in fact, it's the other way around. When Hobbes defines punishment, he defines it in terms of law. Um, so this is at the beginning of chapter 28. A punishment is an evil inflicted by public authority on him that hath done or omitted that which is judged by the same authority to be a transgression of the law, to the end that the will of men may thereby the better be disposed by to obedience. Right? So there's a lot of parts to that definition. And actually, as I didn't assign this whole chapter, a big part of the chapter is going through each of those parts and saying, and if it doesn't meet this criterion, it's not a law but an act of hostility, I mean, sorry, it's not a punishment, but an act of hostility, he always says, right? So, like, if it's not inflicted by the public authority, so right here he's saying there is no punishment in a state of nature. There has to be a public authority. On him that hath done or omitted that which is judged by the same authority to be a transgression of the law, so if the person hasn't violated the law, or if the public authority hasn't judged that the person violated the law, then it's not punishment. To the end that the will of men may thereby the better be disposed to obedience. So if it's done for some other purpose, it's also not punishment. Um, so, um, well, and I guess I didn't emphasize the thing that, that I, that I meant to emphasize to begin with, with it judged by the same authority to be a transgression of the law, right? It's not the authority can't judge that it's bad for some other reason. That, that. To count as a punishment, the, it has to be something that the authority is inflicting evil consequences on because the authority has judged that it's. Maybe I should. Maybe he's not using authority as a noun the way I just am. By public authority means like authorized by the people. That is, it has to be an act of the sovereign, who's the authorized representative, right? So. Um, like if the sovereign decides to um, inflict evil on someone for some other reason, then that's not a punishment. So, I mean, um, as a consequence of this, by definition, um, there can't be punishment of the innocent. So, I mean, it's a little bit tricky. It's, or, well, at least anyway, there can't be punishment of those who are not judged guilty, I guess would be a better way to put it. That is, there can be punishment of someone, well, actually, the way he put it, actually, that's a good question. I never thought about this. No, actually, I have it in my notes here. Yeah, actually, no, the way he defines it, it's an evil inflicted by public authority on him that hath done or omitted that which is judged by the same authority to be a digression, transgression of the law. Oh, okay, so I see. So this is the way it works. You have to have actually done the fact. You have to have done the thing, or else it's not punishment. 
and it has to have been judged to be a transgression of the law. So if the judgment, right, because and that makes sense. So the judgment can be wrong in the sense that you didn't actually do it. And in that case, it's not punishment, according to this definition. But um, um, the judgment can't be wrong in the sense that you did it, but it wasn't really a transgression of the law, because the sovereign is the authorized interpreter of the law. So they can't make a mistake about that. Um, um, right, so um, so what is this? Yeah, so we put those two things together. It's What I said is still right. There, by definition, there can't be punishment of the innocent. Right, and it's tricky because you might think, like, you shouldn't punish innocent people. It's bad to punish innocent people. But actually, the way it works out is that Hobbes has defined punishment so that it's impossible to punish innocent people. Right. Um. Punishment. by definition, requires an actual offense. So, uh, right, that is, in again, in the sense that you have to actually have done it, and it has to have actually been judged by the sovereign. Those two things together mean that you're guilty. So by definition, if you're punished, you're guilty. Now, I mean, uh, one reason I'm saying this is tricky is that, of course, it doesn't follow from this that the sovereign can't uh, inflict evil on you. By the way, I should say... Sometimes I have to mention this in various courses, including this one, I guess. That the, right, we use the word evil now to mean specifically moral evil, usually. Um, um, but Hobbes uses it. Well, I guess this should be clear from the way he defined good and evil way back that when. Maybe I should have emphasized it then, but right, Hobbes is using it in a broader sense where anything bad can be called an evil. But of course, he means he, when, he says when I call it an evil, I mean it's bad for me, <laughs> right? So infl an evil inflicted on. I assume he means it's an evil for that individual that is something they would call an evil. It's a little bit ambiguous. Or should we say it's what's defined as an evil by the sovereign? <laughs> uh, that wouldn't be very effective as a punishment. So I'm going to assume it's the former. Right. So anyway, right. So this none of this says that the, that the sovereign can't inflict an evil on, or that a sovereign doesn't have the right to inflict an evil on someone who's innocent. It just says that if they do inflict an evil on someone who's innocent, it's not punishment. Right. The question of whether and when the sovereign has the right to inflict an evil on someone um, who's innocent is just not addressed at all by this. Um, you know, I mean, this is maybe it's not a perfect example, but it's at least I hope it's getting at what I was saying before, um, last time about propriety of speech that you know, if Hobbes had defined punishment a little bit differently, then there would have been a difficult question about the right of the sovereign to punish someone even though they're innocent. But he's defined it in such a way that there is no such question. 
right? So you can it, you, you see how the definition doesn't it doesn't change anything from true to false, but it changes what you can say and therefore what you can try to prove or what you can ask by providing a word for something and not for something else. All right. Anyway, um, that tr tricky consequence, first of all, is going to be really important when we come to God. Um, because... Um, So this is in um, chapter 31, paragraph 5, at the end, on page 236. And though punishment be due for sin only, because by that word is understood affliction for sin, Yet the right of afflicting is not always derived from men's sin, but from God's power. Right? And he has this interpretation of the book of Job. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Job, but... Uh, um, he gives a pretty good summary of it here, so I won't try to summarize it. But anyway, well, no, I guess I shouldn't say that. He gives a summary of it under a certain interpretation. You know... Job, like the, the, the plot of the book of Job is that Job is being um, afflicted with all these terrible things, even though um, you hear God say at the very beginning of the book that, that Job is perfectly upright and righteous. And there's a story of a kind of like bet that Satan makes with God or something or, uh, you know, but anyway, leaving that aside. So like throughout the book, Job's friends try to convince him that he should accept all the bad things that have happened to him as punishment for his sins. And Job keeps saying, no, I didn't do any sins. <laughs> and at the end of the book, God's voice speaks from the whirlwind and then says all these things, which Hobbes quotes the first one, you know, where were you when I laid the foundations of the heavens and the earth? Right, so I mean, that's it's a difficult um, answer, and and also God says to Job's friends that they're wrong. So it's a difficult, you know, thing to interpret. Um, but actually, it's difficult for most interpreters, but it's easy for Hobbes. <laughs> this one like falls right into his lap because he Hobbes' interpretation of it is that. God's right to inflict bad things on anyone doesn't derive from some kind of right to punish them for transgressing a law. It derives from God's infinite power. Meaning, and as he goes on to explain, right, like, um, you know, humans in a state of nature are... Um, um, equal to each other, and so even though they have a right to do whatever they want to everyone in the state of nature, there's a command, like a law of nature, that commands them to seek peace, and so they'll try to leave that state and enter a commonwealth. But uh, God isn't in the same situation, right? God has an unlimited right in the state of nature, and no one has any power to resist him. So he just keeps that right. Meaning there's no invisible, like, artificial chains <laughs> preventing him from doing whatever he wants to anyone. So Job's friends were wrong. Job's like inflictions don't come because of his sins, but just because God decided to inflict them. <laughs> that's the um, that's Hobbes' reading of the Book of Job's Job, right? So, and again, it's you know, it's um, um, that's why it's important to keep track of, like, you know, so Hobbes will say, God will only punish you if you, tr if you transgress the law of nature. But that's by definition of punishment, not because um, 
God will only do bad things to you if you transgress the law of nature, but because otherwise they won't be punishment. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, um, so as far as the sovereign goes, well, I mean, we know the sovereign can do at least some bad things to you without alleging that you transgressed any law. For example, if the sovereign judges that your property is needed for the common defense, they can just take it because you have no property rights against the sovereign. So you don't have to have done anything wrong. And Hobbes, you know, and other places has given other examples of that. I guess the most important one is this, that if this, in this context, if the sovereign sends people to punish you or comes to punish you themselves, whatever, if the sovereign sends people to punish you, either by death or wounds or imprisonment, then uh, you have the right to resist. Remember Hobbes said way back when, you can't lay down your right to self-preservation, so you have the right to resist. Um, uh, actually, maybe that's not the example. Is that the example I want? Because then it is punishment. He gave another example like this. Remember the details. Oh, he gave the example of the people of Athens and the custom of ostracism. Right, this is an interesting example. So that the, the and right, remember, according to Hobbes, the entire people, I mean, it's all the free men, right? Like, again, it's actually families that take part in the assembly, not individuals. Oh, uh, Tamara, did you raise your hand? Yes. Um, I was just wondering, um, Al Alvaro asked a question that I also wanted to know. I don't oh. know if you, I think from my understanding is that the sovereign is immune from the law. Correct? I just wanted to. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's, that's the second thing I'm going to talk about. But again, the short answer is, it, is that the sovereign is not subject to the civil law. The subject, sovereign is subject to the law of nature, but of course that doesn't mean that anyone other than God can punish the sovereign, right? It doesn't mean that, that we can take the sovereign to court for violating the law of nature or that we can set up a you know, um, war crimes tribunal to try the sovereign or something. It means that God will punish the sovereign for violating the law of nature. Right, so basically the sovereign is not subject to any law any human law. Okay, so it's only God that can judge him or her or them. Or them, yeah, right. So, uh, thank you. And again, I mean, I started to talk about that a little bit, but I'm going to talk more, I hope, if I have time for it, about what divine punishment comes to, what it means that God might punish you. So, um, um, Okay, I'm thing. so sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, it's so, okay. no, no, it's fine. Please interrupt and ask questions. It's it's better than me uh, going on and on and people not understanding. <laughs> Much better. Okay. All right. Yeah. So. No, um. Okay. So I'm so sorry, but divine. So you're saying divine punishment. So that means that there's, that would mean that there's. The pun. There's like two kinds of punishment. Oh well. I mean, uh, there's different punishment depending on who the sovereign is who has public authority to inflict it. Um, so when you talk about the human sovereign of the commonwealth, that would be like regular punishment, I guess, civil punishment. But when you talk about God punishing as sovereign of the world, then that's divine punishment. So it's not, 
I mean, well, there's something weird about divine punishment, but at least like the way it's set out, it's not supposed to be a different kind of punishment. It's just punishment inflicted by God. Does that does that help? What? Yes, it does. Okay, I see Kevin has his hand up. Yeah, I was curious if, so if the state of nature exists and individuals in their state of nature and to leave that a sovereign is established in the modern period where we're in, would the UN or things like that be seen as a way in making nation states no longer in a state of nature? Well, um, so uh, only if they are sovereign. <laughs> so they have to have all the powers. I mean, again, there's 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 a question, and it's going to come. I'm going to talk about it in a moment. I hope there's a question whether we have any commonwealths because there's there's never been commonwealths where there are almost none where where one person or assembly has all the powers that Hobbes says they're supposed to have. So uh, does it, I mean, or at least that they've been comp uh, publicly acknowledged to have all those powers, right? Uh, you know, he has to argue that they really have them or, yeah. So, but anyway, but I mean, the UN, I, I take it is not close to having these powers, right? The UN can't uh, levy taxes. The UN can't make laws really. The UN can't, yeah. I mean, it's not, um, I don't know. I guess I, I don't know. I guess if the Security Council operated by majority the way he says they would have to, and if only they made the decisions, maybe there would be enough power. They can authorize wars. I don't know. I'm not sure what he, but, but, but since it, but because of the vetoes, as Hobbes predicts, it would predict it's ineffective. <laughs> yeah. Right, so there's a number of questions here. Wouldn't divine punishment be a subtype of punishment? I mean, I guess it depends what you mean by a type of punishment. Like, uh, you know, like a pen on my table is a type of pen, sort of, but it's not really a different kind of pen. It's just a pen that's on my table. That's what I meant when I said it's not a different kind of punishment. But, like, if you're, you know, not interested in that, distinction, then sure, you can call it a subtype of punishment. But it's just, just like you could call American punishment one kind of punishment, punishment by the American government, and French punishment another kind of punishment, punishment by the French government. They're really the same thing, right? They don't have defi different definitions. Um, okay, there's another question. International law is critiqued because there is no sovereign, though, right? Yeah, that's what I was just saying. Um, I mean, the sovereign should be the Security Council, perhaps, but uh, but it doesn't. It isn't set up right the way Hobbes would say it should be, and it doesn't. For also, it, yeah, it doesn't choose its own members. Um, so uh, and also, I think if you went through the list, you would see that it's missing a lot of the powers. Yeah, it can't can't decide what is the one true religion <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty even if it could wage war that not much else it can do um okay um and okay so tamara says is the sovereign one sole individual in a monarchy the sovereign is an individual in an aristocracy the sovereign is an assembly of part of the people in a democracy the the sovereign is an assembly of the whole people also as i just pointed out that really means of all the families as you can see from the fact that he keeps treating Athens as a democracy, even though women and slaves, you know, were not part of the assembly. So it's the heads of families that are that are on the assembly, apparently. Um, okay. Right. He said them. Oh, okay. You're answering that question. 
Yeah, of course, now that we, and I'm totally on board with this, but it does cause new confusions. Now that we're using they more as a singular pronoun, it's become more ambiguous when I say them. But it, the, the sovereign could be any individual of whatever genders there may be, or a, um, assembly of individuals. Um, Samantha, did you have a question? your connection you were trying to make to um, punishment and the propriety of speech, um, which we were talking about last class. So yes. were you saying that the reason why we can, I guess, punish speech is not because it's right or wrong or true or, or false, but rather because it's an action. And if the sovereign judges it to be a transgression, it can be punishable. Well, why we could punish speech no, I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about the Hobbes's act of defining punishment as an example of why um, what is proper speech may depend on what you want it to be possible to argue, for example. So you'll choose your definitions in such a way. Uh, yeah, punishing speech is, uh, I mean, uh, Hobbes argues pretty consistently that speech is one of the most dangerous things in the Commonwealth, and so obviously the sovereign has to carefully regulate it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, he like for him there is no. I mean, he's arguing it so vociferously because he knows there's already people in England saying that freedom of speech is important, and that you know, right, and that it, it should be protected against the king, but. Uh, but he's definitely taking the other side and saying, obviously, speech is not only any old action, but it's a really powerful action. It can cause civil wars. It can, um, um, uh, cause all kinds of moral corruption. It has to be carefully regulated. Who gets to say what? Um, but that's that. That's what I was talking about. I was just talking about. I wasn't talking about punishment of speech. I was talking about defining punishment as an example of Hobbes' attitude towards language. <laughs> what you're, what he's trying to do when he defines something. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, you know what? I'm going to skip what I was going to say about ostracism, uh, although it's interesting. Um, and move on to this to the other thing that you know so i mean i guess all i want to say about that is it seems like for a human sovereign as well um um there's plenty of ways they can inflict evil on people that are just in the sense that they don't violate the law of nature but that are not punishment meaning that the that the people on whom the evil is inflicted have not transgressed some law and don't deserve it for that reason. Um, okay, so um, so because of it's it's because of this way that law and punishment are related to each other, namely that law isn't defined in terms of punishment, but punishment is defined in terms of law. I, th I think this is why Hobbes thinks you might have a question like this. Okay, I understand where the sovereign gets the right to make laws. That's part of the authority they were given when we formed the Commonwealth. But where do they get the right to punish? Now, I mean, you might think, well, like, I mean, obviously, that's also one of the powers we gave them when we set up the Commonwealth. Um, but there's a puzzle about that because um, of what I was just saying, uh, starting to say before, namely that um, I can't authorize the sovereign to punish me, at least... And this is interesting. I can, I can, I could authorize the sovereign to to inflict a monetary punishment on me, a 
fine or mulked as Hobbes calls it, right? But, uh, but I can't authorize the sovereign to imprison me or um, uh, physically harm me or kill me. Um, now, I can authorize the sovereign to um, uh, command me to assist in punishing others. But um, there's something funny about that, too, because then um, if I do assist the sovereign in punishing someone else, uh, they haven't authorized that. Right. So it's not so. So in that respect, they're not part of the covenant that I'm that I'm enforcing. So. Um, uh, um, that can't be how I am allowed to do it. Right. So. Ne so like neither I nor the saw nor. I mean, I, I mean, this is I, in a way what I said should be obvious, right? That is, they didn't authorize the sovereign to do it, and I'm only doing it on the sovereign's authority. But the sovereign doesn't have their authority to do it, so I can't be doing it. it so, like, neither the sovereign nor I can be doing it on their authority. That is, on the authority of the covenant between us. Um. Right, and that's why Hobbes says, um, and this is on page 204, chapter um, 28, paragraph 2. It is manifest, therefore, that the right which the commonwealth that is, he or they that represent it, hath to punish, is not grounded on any concession or gift of the subjects. The subjects didn't give the sovereign the right to punish. Again, I think he's assuming that punishment here is corporal punishment. I think maybe he even says that at the beginning of the paragraph. So, um, um, because as far as, you know, monetary punishment, well, the, the sovereign has the right to take all my money anytime, basically, right? So they, there can't be a problem with that. But corporal punishment. So, um, Um, now, I mean, I think the reason I started this by saying is that Hobbes might think that you'd have a question like this or that you'd be puzzled by this is that I think that if you pay attention the whole time to what Hobbes means by right and so forth, that this question wouldn't really come up. Um, but, uh, but, you know, since he knows you may not have been paying complete attention to his definitions, he's going to explain to you in detail why, what the answer is in this case. And the answer is basically, um, look, you're assuming that the right to inflict violence on someone must come from their consent. Um, Right? And then the paradox is they couldn't consent to that. But instead, you have to remember that um, the, from Hobbes' point of view, the, the question is not where to get rights to do things, but how to lay them down. <laughs> In the state of nature, according to Hobbes, everyone has the right and this is where remembering what Hobbes means by right is important, right? That is, there's no impediment to anyone inflicting whatever they want on anyone else. Um, 
Um, so when we formed the Commonwealth, we didn't um, give up the right of um, inflicting harm on other people. Um, at least we certainly didn't give up the right of inflicting harm on other people in self-defense because we can't give that up. What did we do? Well, we assigned it to our agent, <laughs> right? We didn't just lay it down and leave it there. We transferred it to the sovereign, um, which, um, but if you look into that farther, I think it means that, you know, what we agreed with each other is that um, um, we wouldn't stand in the way of and would assist the sovereign in exerting their natural right to inflict um, punishment on people. Well, or let's say to inflict evil on people when it's in the best, the, their, the, their best interests. The best interest of the sovereign means the best interest of the commonwealth, right? Because the sovereign represents the commonwealth. Um, so um, what we said to each other is that um, the way we assigned that power to our agent was, because again, like a power isn't something you can literally give to something. The way we assigned that power to our agent was we said, we won't, I won't stand in the way of the sovereign exercising this power on my behalf against you. And in fact, I'll insist, I'll assist. Um, so I get, I mean, I guess it's confusing here because there's a bunch of different levels you can look at it, so to speak. Like, I mean, if you, you can just talk about it with, you know, in terms of right without figuring out exactly what Hobbes means by a right and the transferal of a right and so on and so forth. And then again, the answer is simple. Like, we didn't give, we didn't give the, I didn't give the sovereign the right to punish me. It's just that um, no one took it away. <laughs> the sovereign's still in the state of nature. That's where the sovereign gets the right to punish me. But then you have to look into the details of what that means about what, how the covenant worked. So, so anyway, the conclusion of this is um, basically that um, my reason to obey the law is not that I have authorized the sovereign to punish me if I transgress it, because I haven't. But my reason to obey the law is that everyone else has authorized the sovereign to punish me if I transgress it. Okay, other questions about that? Again, one reason I'm emphasizing this is this, this, this is another thing that's going to come back to haunt us, the question of where the right to punishment comes from, whether it's possible to punish in the state of nature, if so, who can do it, etc. Okay, so here's, all right. So me inflicting pain on another is justified in the case that the sovereign saw a greater good to it. But if my obligation was just to inflict pain and not to kill, I ended up killing someone, then I committed evil, and that was unjust, even if they were guilty. Okay, well, I mean, that's going into a much more complicated question. So, like, yeah, obviously, if you deliberately um, um, inflicted, if you deliberately killed someone, uh, um, against the, you know, without the authorization of the sovereign, then you're violating the peace and you're, you know, uh, you're violating the law of nature, presumably. But in any case, um, you're definitely violating some civil laws. I, you know, um, now, I mean, I guess, like, if you mean, well, I wasn't trying to kill them, the sovereign, you know, told me to 
to torture them, but it just like, unfortunately they weren't in good shape or whatever, you know, I don't know. That's obviously some a detail that the civil law is going to deal with, you would assume, right? Like under what circumstances, what counts as a like reasonable um, obedience to the sovereign's command? Um, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I was just thinking, like, maybe perhaps it was a written law, and um, the sovereign told me, oh, can you carry out this punishment? But um, it was just to, like, maybe flog them or something. And then, I don't know, I misjudged, and I ended up killing the person. Yeah. So, is the sovereign unjust, or am I unjust? If it wasn't on purpose. Well, it's not, if it, if, you know, like if, if it was, if it was just an accident, then no one was unjust. Right. So like, in other words, if, if you were flogging them and then, you know, uh, like by accident, your whip happened to knock the 20 pound weight off the shelf and it fell on their head. You know, I mean, maybe that's even not a good enough example, but I'm saying like, in other words, if you weren't negligent, then obviously no one was unjust. The question would come, like, you know, uh, and you're right to say that with the sovereign telling you to do something is not normally a matter of the king looking in your window and saying, do this, right? It's normally a matter of you, you know, having a job under certain laws to do certain things, whatever. Um, you know, so, uh, like, like, you know, the question of, whether you are unjust and can be punished. Remember, unjust, there's only injustice in a commonwealth. So whether you're unjust means, did you violate the law of nature or the civil law um, as interpreted by the sovereign? So, you know, I mean, that's going to potentially be a complicated question, just as if you're not punishing someone, you know, if you're painting their roof and you you know, you fall, your your ladder falls down on them and kills them. You know, were you unjust or not? Well, it's going to be a complicated question. Were you negligent, etc.? Am I, is there still a, a part to your question that I'm not getting? Um, no, you answered that part, but um, just for clarification. So God cannot be unjust, and the sovereign, whatever, if it's a body or one person, they can possibly be unjust, they, but are usually are not. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, okay, so the question of whether they can be unjust is a question of whether they fall under some law. So let me, I, I want to talk about that later. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm still going to get. That's okay, I still, thank I you. Still mean thank what you I, for answering my I still mean what I say. I'm glad there's so many questions. It's actually, I mean, I don't, I don't know why, but it's good. Like last Quarter, I was lecturing and lecturing and I kept saying are there any questions and there was just like nothing so this is great <laughs> but it is causing me to readjust my ideas about what I'm going to get to that's all um, speaking of that Hi, Kevin, yeah I get shy to ask a question but I force myself to do it but um, okay, I, good. Why. I, I can't speak for everyone else but I'm sure it happens <laughs> Oh, that people are shy? Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, but that's why I'm so happy when people do it. Because, yeah, I know it's I know it's not necessarily easy. I don't think I'm mean when I answer, but I'm... No, I, um, I really did like Alvar... Uh, I can't pronounce his name. I'm so sorry. Alvaro? Um, his question where he said... Um, this is how I understand it in the state of nature. I harm anyone I want, but in the law of nature, I cannot harm someone due to my right, due to my right to harm being stripped, but a public authority like the police can inflict harm to someone without reasons, like a criminal. Within reasons. Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah. Well, but again, the, the, I mean, the question, the Hobbes' question is where the public authority gets that right. And, and, you know, his conclusion is they don't get it because the criminal gave it to them. 
because the criminal couldn't give it to them. They get it because no one took it away from them. So they're still in the state of nature in that respect. Um, Right, and now I see the next thing Alvaro said. I think it would depend on how much immunity the sovereign has. Well, I mean, the sovereign, according to Hobbes, has complete immunity, right? That is, even if the sovereign is walking down Fifth Avenue and pulls, up, pulls out a gun and shoots someone for no reason at all, the sovereign is not subject to the civil laws, so they can't be prosecuted. Um... So, uh, I mean, they are subject to the law of nature, but even that they can't be punished by human courts for violating it. So, um, and therefore also um, the sovereign can grant immunity to other people. Um, but they won't necessarily. Right. I mean, it might. It's probably a bad idea to tell the people, the torturers, or the people who flog criminals or whatever, that no matter what you do, you'll be okay. Because you, you, you know. I mean, if you wanted them to be killed, that you would have made the law the death penalty. Right. You made it flogging. That means you didn't want them to be killed. So, so presumably, like, if the sovereign is rational, they will not grant complete immunity to everyone who acts in their name. Um, let's see. Right, so what if there's clashes between the law of nature and the civil law? Well, you know, so, and then bringing the example of mass incarceration, um, you know, of course, that's only one out of many, many, many examples of how sovereigns, I mean, I guess it's a particularly relevant one for us here now, but I just want to point out, right, it's just like the tip of the iceberg as far as what sovereigns can do to their people that are violations of the law of nature. So what will happen if the sovereign violates the law of nature? Well, you know, Vanessa, you said it. Um, it will disrupt peace if it's bad enough, right? I mean, you can tell people um, as long as you want that they should obey the sovereign no matter what, but when things get bad enough, they're going to rebel. <laughs> um, so, and that will lead to civil war and potentially, you know, a return to the state of nature, which will be bad for everyone, including the now former sovereign. So, I mean, maybe instead of putting this off, since it keeps coming up, I should actually talk about it now, especially because I'm not trying to get to the end of the lecture. So uh, let, me, let me go to the thing he says about divine punishment. Um, now let's see, where is that? Okay, so this is chapter 31, paragraph 40, on page 243. Hmm. Foreseeing punishments are consequent to the breach of laws. Natural punishments must be naturally consequent to the breach of the laws of nature. And therefore, follow them as their natural, not arbitrary effects. Right? So... So he's saying that when you violate the law of nature, the punishment has to be a natural consequence of your, of your crime. Not an arbitrary consequence. That is, um, it can't be a consequence that 
um, someone, and the someone would be God, right? But it can't be a consequence that someone just decided, who knows why, to attach to this act. Right? Like, so for example, it, you know, um, if the sovereign violates the law of nature and is then struck by lightning, that wouldn't be a punishment for a violation of the natural law based on what Hobbes just saying, because there's no natural connection between violating the law of nature and getting struck by lightning. But by the way, um, Kevin, you do you still have your hand up or you just didn't take it down? Oh, my bad. I didn't take it down. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, so why is he saying that? Well, um, if you look back at the definition of law, again, um, and where was that again? Page 173. Uh, So, um, well, actually, this is the definition. I'm sorry. Why did I read the wrong thing? Because I put my star next to the wrong thing. But it is. But they are the same. This says why this is the definition. Then this gives the definition. Um, so, um, oh wait. But anyway, it wasn't the definition of law. I wanted to look. How is the definition of punishment? Oh, so All right. Hold on a second. Chapter 78, the beginning. The punishment has to be inflicted for transgression of the law um, to the end that the will of men may thereby the better be disposed to obedience. And it's from that last clause that, um, well, no, that's actually wrong. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting so confused. It's because I started doing things out of order. Uh, it actually is from the definition of law. So it's, okay, so, all right, so law is a command. Um, and to be a command, it has to be received. That's what Hobbes goes on to say in the continuation of that um, after the definition of law. So, so one of the things that Hobbes uh, deduces from the definition is that it's essential to law that they, it be promulgated. Right? So in the case of human laws, that means that it has to be um, spoken or written in a public place and, you know, transmitted in such a way that everyone can know about it if they want to. Um, otherwise, it's not a command and therefore not a law. So, um, but then punishment, since punishment by definition is connected to law, pu punishment also can only be for something that you actually have been warned may be punished. So um, in the case of law, the laws of nature, how are, they, how are they promulgated? By reason. Um, right? I mean, Hobbes says there's two parts of the divine law. One is the part that is like the divine positive law given through the prophets. So that could have any content. You have to ask the prophets what it is. That's similar to the civil law in a commonwealth. In fact, Hobbes says it is the civil law of the Jewish commonwealth under Moses. So, um, um, uh, but the other part of the divine law is the part the natural part, and that's the part you can arrive at by reason. And Hobbes says that's the same as the law of nature that I discussed in chapters 14 and 15. So 
what I'm getting to, the conclusion I'm getting to here is by reason, you have to be warned by reason that you'll be punished if you violate this law. How can that be? Um, how can it be that, um, how can I deduce by my reason that I'll be punished for violating a certain law? Well, what Hobbes says here, I mean, we'll see Locke giving a different answer, I think. But what Hobbes says in the part I just read is, the only way you can tell by reason if a punishment is going to follow from violating a law is if the punishment is a natural consequence of the law that you can deduce. A natural punch, punishment, national, natural consequence of the violation of the law that you can deduce from the meaning of the law. So all that adds up to how does God punish you for violating the laws of nature? Because violating the laws of nature is a bad idea and bad things will happen to you if you violate them, that's the divine punishment. Right? It's a natural consequence of the violation. So he, Hobbes goes on there to, to give some examples, right? Like, he's, you know, he says, for example, temperance is a law of nature, right? That was one of those laws of nature that's not political, and therefore he's not going to discuss it. But remember, he said certain things, such as drunkenness, are forbidden by the law of nature because they tend to your own destruction, um, right? So, like... So the, the violation of that law, which you could call temperance, right? Like don't drink too much, etc. cetera. Um, the, the punishment for violating that law is that your health will be destroyed. That's a divine punishment. It's, you know, it was caused by God <laughs> because everything is caused by God. And it's, and it's a consequence of a violation of this law. It's a natural consequence of it. So similarly, if you ask, if it, when you say, you know, God, why should the sovereign keep the law of nature? The thing is a violation of the law of nature. Um, I mean, they shouldn't even say it. Hobbes says that, right, you shouldn't even complain about the injustice of your sovereign, let alone try to do something about it. But it, but it nevertheless can be unjust, a violation of the use, right? It can be a violation of, it can be overstepping the sovereign's right in the sense that there's a law that is an artificial impediment in the way of the sovereign doing it. Only that law is the law of nature, not the law of the commonwealth. And it's going to be enforced by God, not by the commonwealth. And how is God going to enforce it? The way God enforces the laws of nature is that you shouldn't do these things because they'll lead to your own, your, your own destruction. By, as a natural consequence, right? So coming back to this, in, this, this uh, example that Vanessa said, uh, like for example, laws of nature seek peace ultimately, but what about laws that lead to mass incarceration? Then that would obviously disrupt peace within pe people of color. So then would the sovereign be at fault? And the answer is yes, if the sovereign makes laws that result in uh, uh, disruption of peace, then the sovereign has violated the law of nature and the sovereign will be punished by it. And how will they be punished by it? Because the commonwealth will be dissolved, potentially, at least it will be threatened, right? And a threat to the commonwealth means a threat to the sovereign. The sovereign will no longer exist if the commonwealth doesn't exist. Also, the natural person or people who make up the sovereign will be in the same boat as the rest of us once we return to the state of nature. So it's bad for them too, right? But for the sovereign, it's fatal, basically. If 
right? The sovereign is the person of the Commonwealth. If the Commonwealth is dissolved by civil war, the sovereign is gone. So, um, so the sovereign will be punished by death for violating the laws of nature um, badly enough for long enough. So Vanessa says, would natural disasters be considered divine punishments? Not unless they're natural consequences of violating the law of nature. Uh, so perhaps if they're caused by climate change, <laughs> although I don't think, you know, like Hobbes, uh, like most, if not all people in this period, doesn't contemplate the possibility that humans could do something that would damage nature, right? It, it was thought, you know, like that's ridiculous. It's, it's so much bigger than us. <laughs> um, and it was, I mean, it was, I don't know if it was already false then. I guess it was, I mean, in the, you know, like, I don't know if we're sure about this, but paleontologists, uh, I think, tend to believe that the extinction of the um, Pleistocene megafauna, like you know, woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers and all those, that that, that was caused by the arrival of humans in the New World. <laughs> um, uh, so even though all they had was stone spears and whatever they were able to cause a mass extinction on a local scale um so, so kevin i noticed your hand is up again now does that mean now it's up for real ah I no you just still What's okay happening? you just couldn't didn't manage to take it down okay um right so but it, anyway hobbs doesn't I don't think Hobbes contemplates the possibility of humans causing natural disasters by doing something wrong. So that means natural disasters will never be a consequence of human violations of the law of nature. So they will not ever be divine punishments, according to Hobbes. Um, you know, how to square that with the Bible is an interesting question, but... <laughs> um, Um, I think, actually, I think I know how he would square it with the Bible, although even this still causes a problem, like with Jonah, some other texts. But, you know, he would say that, uh, um, if God miraculously punishes some laws, then those must not be laws of nature. They must be divine positive laws. Okay, that's that's going to get us very far. I mean, into all kinds of questions. Like, you have to always remember that, and everything I just said about the punishment of the laws of nature, I, I hope can at least um, point towards understanding how this how this could make sense, that Hobbes is probably an atheist. So, um, so uh, like all this, God this and God this, and it's so important that the sovereign is subject to God. Um, you know, why would you say that if you're an atheist? Well, um, because like God as a supernatural um, actor is not involved in this punishment of the divine law, a, a violation of the divine law, right? It's something, again, you can deduce from your reason will be a bad consequence of doing certain things. And so why is the sovereign bound by the law of nature, not only in foro interno, but in foro externo? Um, right? That is, if the sovereign is, because in this, we're all commanded by the, by the divine law, that is the law of nature in the state of nature. But um, we're not 
uh, it doesn't bind in foro externo. That is, remember, it, it commands the inner motion of desire, but um, that doesn't, in the state of nature, get translated into any outer motion of our limbs. And at least what I was claiming last time is that that's because... See, I mean, you, when, when someone says the law binds internally but not externally, you might think it means something like it requires you to desire it, but it's optional whether you do something about it or not. Something like Professor, that. Professor, did you rub something on the board? Oh, yes, I did. And uh, my camera is frozen up. All I did was draw that little picture of the stick figure with the internal motion. Yeah, right? So you might think that it means the law commands this internal motion, but the external motion is optional. But um, actually what it means, I think, according to Hobbes, is that in the state of nature, um, there is no external motion that will... Um, that will result in the desire being fulfilled. So that's why uh, it can only bind in foro interno. That is, as far as individuals go in the state of nature, there's nothing they can do to make there be peace, to make compacts be observed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, um, but. And I think this is the difference in the case of the sovereign. The sovereign, there is something they can do. So this, again, I mean, I don't know, this, you know like, what's on the board has kind of gotten away from what I'm talking about. But, <laughs> um, like, um, remember, I said, and, I, and I'm still not sure what to call it, but call it the original state of nature. In the original state of nature, the persons are um, individuals or families. So I'm not going to, it says original state of nature. This says individual slash family, right? And it's about them. Well, it's really only about individuals that Hobbes proves that they're equal. Um, but I guess if you dig a little bit deeper, you'll see that by definition, a family that's not a commonwealth is a family that's small enough that that's still true, right? So that even the weakest could, um, can kill the strongest, right? So there's like a family of five people and I'm weaker than any of them still by deceit or by ganging up with others, I can kill them. So our rights are still equal, Right? Neither of us can bet, can make a good bet that they could defeat the other. Um, so, but then there's like, the state of nature for sovereigns. Right? And here it's like, you know, Each sovereign represents a commonwealth. Some of them are smaller, some of them are bigger. So, I mean, the consequence of that, that I, that I, um, right, so this is a sovereign. This, sorry, this whole thing, this whole circle is a commonwealth. So the consequence of this I mentioned before is that it's no longer clear that all of these persons are equal, right? Some commonwealth might be much, much stronger than the others. And that's what makes commonwealth by acquisition possible, right? That, that like 
in the state of nature other than uh, parental dominion is maybe is a partial exception to this but in the state of nature commonwealth by acquisition can't really happen that is i can't seek peace by forcing a whole bunch of people to be at peace but if i'm a sovereign i possibly can so that's one consequence, but now I'm emphasizing another consequence, which is in this relation between the sovereign and the commonwealth. So the sovereign is not a member, is not a subject of the commonwealth. All these dots are the subjects, either individuals or families of the commonwealth. Um, so now um, the sovereign remains in a state of nature, but because they're sovereign of a commonwealth, they have um, a lot of power to either, and the power derives from the covenant between the subjects. Well, at least in a commonwealth by, by institution, it does. Yeah, maybe that's complicated because of commonwealth by acquisition. So, but in any case, the, the sovereign, because of some covenants, that all the subjects have reasons to keep has ends up with a lot of power to either bring about peace or not. Well, I didn't notice Alvaro's question. So a random earthquake is not divine punishment, but building a house on the edge of a mountain with a risk of landslide or mudslide is a divine punishment. I mean, yeah, I guess, assuming, I don't know how far he thinks prudence is a law of nature, uh, but to some extent, for sure, yeah. So building your house in a, in a dangerous place would be just like drinking too much. You, it's a vice that you'd be punished for. I mean, you know, the question is, well, what about building your house in a state that has wildfires and earthquakes all the time. <laughs> but, uh, well, anyway, be that as it may. Right, so getting back to this picture. So, the, right, so, so now, although the sovereign's still in the state of nature, it's not like this original state of nature where there's no, nothing that any individual can do to, um, um, to carry out that desire that the law of nature commands. And again, why does it mean that the law of nature commands it? It means that it's reasonable to want this because it would be good for you, <laughs> right? So it's reasonable for the sovereign to want the law of nature um, to be followed um, by the subjects and by themselves, by the sovereign themselves. But unlike those individuals or families in state of nature, there's something they can do about it, right? If they obey the law of nature and they take proper care of their commonwealth, then there will be peace. If they don't, then they'll be punished, right? So. So that's the sense in which, um, like, God has announced to the sovereign that the laws of nature are now going to be enforced against you, even though in the state of nature they're normally not enforced. Right? I'm like I'm piecing this all together. There's no one place where Hobbes says this. You have to put the different def definitions and stuff together. But I think when you do, that's the way it comes out. So. Um, so the sovereign really is bound to be just and equitable, like Kevin said, like karma. And Alvaro said, I think it's like karma with deducible reasons. Yeah, exactly. Karma, like, if, if karma could be foreseen by natural reasons, By natural science, basically, is what Hobbes means here. Um, so uh, the way he understands natural science, which is weird, but anyway, 
Um, so, uh, um, yeah, so the sovereign really is bound to be just, but the only, um, the, but, but the, the thing that binds the sovereign to be just is the fact that things will go badly if they're not. So actually, um, now I'm getting completely away from the outline of my notes, but it's a good thing, I think. I mean, it's better to have the lecture that you of the th composed of things that you wanted to ask about, right, rather than the one composed of things I thought were interesting. <laughs> um, so right at the end of book two, um, Hobbes basically finishes the content of book two. Oh no, now this camera's frozen. There it is. So Hobbes basically finishes the content of um, book two, right? At the beginning of paragraph 41, he says, and thus far concerning the constitution, nature, and rights of sovereigns, and concerning the duty of subjects derived from the principles of natural reason. So that, in effect, is the end of book two, but then he adds this little note, which is about... Um, what good do you think it's going to do to lay out all these principles, Hobbes? And he says, um, and now considering how different this doctrine is from the practice of the greatest part of the world, especially of these Western parts, that have received their moral learning from Rome and Athens. See, this is an interesting, like, um, version of Orientalism, <laughs> right? It's like, so there is this feeling, I mean, he alluded to it before when he talked about the citizens of Constantinople, meaning Istanbul, right? Meaning the Ot citizens of the Ottoman Empire. So, um, Right? There is this idea in Europe that, you know, um, especially in Western Europe, especially, that, um, you know, we have relatively free, even though they're still all living under monarchies, they already have this idea, right? We have relatively free institutions, not like those Oriental despots, right? Like the Grand Turk, the Ottoman Empire, Emperor. Right? We have rights as citizens, and we have, you know, parliaments and, and uh, you know, uh, independent religious institutions and so on and so forth. Um, so Hobbes is, like, giving voice to that prejudice, but from his point of view, it's the Oriental side is the good side, <laughs> Right? He's saying in other parts of the world, some people actually know what's required for sovereignty and they've set it up right. But unfortunately here, where we got these, where we inherited these Western institutions from Rome and Athens, that has uh, screwed up our, our, our political arrangements. And that's why we keep having so many civil wars and wars of religion and uh, so on and so forth, which in the 17th century was a pretty reasonable thing to say about Western Europe, right? It was like, it was like the Middle East. It was like constantly at war. Um, I mean, like the Middle East is now, not like the Middle East was then. Then the Middle East was the Ottoman Empire. Right, so... Um, uh, Right? So Hobbes is like a, I don't know how far to push this, but Hobbes is, is you know, you could imagine like a kind of a, a news analysis program in Istanbul where people are asking, you know, why is Western Europe such a violent 
region full of religious fanatics and intolerance and constantly at war with each other. And, you know, they could call Hobbes to be on the panel and he would say, well, you know, it's unfortunately because they've inherited these bad cultural institutions from Rome and Athens. <laughs> all right. Anyway, that was all kind of a, uh, I don't know what to say, uh, like putting a lot of things into a different perspective. Um, um, it should, you know, religious terrorism was invented in Holland in the 15th, 16th century by Anabaptists who um, started doing stuff like blowing up monasteries. <laughs> uh, okay, anyway, getting back to this. Um, so Hobbes says, when I see how bad our institutions are and how far people are from acknowledging these principles, I, I feel like I'm, I sh maybe I should despair and think that my principles will never come into being any more than the ones that Plato set up in the Republic. And he says, for he also is of opinion that it is impossible for the disorders of state and change of governments by civil war ever to be taken away till sovereigns be philosophers. Right now, of course, Plato's philosophical principles aren't the same as Hobbes's and his uh, political conclusions aren't the same as Hobbes's, although they're not that different. At least if you take the Republic to be, if you take the city that Socrates imagines in the latter parts of the Republic to be really what Plato thinks the best city is, which is unclear. Um, um, but anyway, so, but Hobbes is saying they both agree that you know, for this to happen, the sovereigns will have to become educated in political philosophy. But then he says, um, basically because other people, including Pr Plato, didn't have the right principles, when he thinks about that, and he thinks, I do have the right principles, <laughs> he says um, that he, he, he has some hope after all. Right? And the hope is, I recover some hope that, one time or another, this writing of mine may fall into the hands of a sovereign. I guess now he's thinking of a monarch, right? I mean, fall into the hands of a democratic assembly? Like, what would that mean? Who will consider it himself? Yeah, so he's thinking of the sovereign. He's forgetting that... Or ignoring that the sovereign might not be an individual, or I guess he's implying this could only happen in a monarchy, maybe. So, but it, so it will might fall into the hands of a sovereign who will consider it himself, for it is short. It's not that short, but okay. <laughs> um, it is short, and I think clear, without the help of any interested or envious interpreter. And by exercise of entire sovereignty and protecting the public teaching of it, convert this truth of speculation into the utility of practice. So what that suggests is that in some that the intended audience for this book is sovereigns. Um, that the point of publishing it is mostly that. Um, that will make it more likely that sometime it could fall into the hands of a sovereign. <laughs> so, in other words, it's just like Machiavelli's The Prince, at least like it claims to be. It's not clear that it's not a parody. That's a, another complicated story. But it, it that, that basically this is really a manual for monarchs. Um, and that that would explain a lot, right? That you know, why go on so much about the obligations of the sovereign and the content of the laws of nature and so on and so forth if um, uh, none of us have any right to do anything about it? And the answer is, it makes a lot of sense if you're talking to the sovereign and you're saying, don't do this because God will punish you. And if the sovereign studies it carefully enough, and understands it, the sovereign will realize that means 
I've just proved to you that this is a really terrible idea. This meaning, you know, um, on the one hand, stuff that we think of as terrible ideas, like perhaps mass incarceration, um, or just randomly changing the law every day, which according to Hobbes, the sovereign has every right to do, right? Or um, uh, make just making random laws for individual people, which again, according to Hobbes, there's nothing to prevent the sovereign from doing that. But those things might involve violations of the laws of nature, like violations of equity or whatever. But, but it's also things that we think are good ideas, but that Hobbes thinks is a terrible idea. Like, for example, granting religious freedom, granting freedom of speech, um, you know, uh, allowing limitations, conceding limitations on your power, um, sharing power with an elected assembly, right? Like all those things that Hobbes thinks are really bad ideas. Um, he's hoping those, those are also violations of the sovereign's duty under the law of nature. And Hobbes is hoping that some sovereign will pick this up and be like, oh, Wow, so I shouldn't have ever concede any of that stuff. That will lead to the dissolution of the Commonwealth. <laughs> and then finally we'll get a king who does what a king should do in this country, damn it. <laughs> um, that's his plan. Um, okay, are there questions about that? I'm kind of, since I did kind of go off track from my notes, I'm not even sure what I would talk about in the last three minutes. I ended up getting to most of the things I wanted to talk about, I think. Except, well, I still never did talk about socialism versus private property. Oh, Alvaro says that would, I guess, make sense since the book is made for the sovereign assuming that the sovereign does not want to allow another source of power to rise and become the new sovereign. Well, yeah, but, you know, the sovereign might think, first of all, the sovereign might think of the law of nature quite differently, or the divine law quite differently than Hobbes is defining it and setting it out, right? They might think, um, you know, God wants me to allow everyone to worship him in their own way, or God wants me to respect the church, or, um, you know, uh, God wants me to respect the ancient customs of this land and not be arrogant and try to impose my own will, or right, all kinds of things, you know, or the sovereign might think, um, you know, uh, I would rather have all the power, but under current circumstances, this is what Hobbes says William the Conqueror and his, his successor William Rufus both did, that like the sovereign might think, yeah, I would like to have absolute power, but I realize under current circumstances it's going to be hard to consolidate my power if I try to do that. So instead, I, you know, I'll take a lot of power, but I'll, you know, I'll allow certain limits. Also like William and Mary did after the Restoration, or at the Restoration. So, you know, um, Hobbes is coming to tell all of those sovereigns, don't do it. Um, don't think that, yeah, I would like to have all the power, but either God forbids it, or it's not um, prudent, to claim it, like, right, and eventually overthrow the old sovereign. Alvaro says, well, you know, I mean, in a sense, that's the best outcome from Hobbes' point of view. If there's a clean overthrow of the old sovereign after a short civil war, right, the worst outcome is protracted civil war, state of nature, war of all against all. And, you know, by the way, he's definitely right that that's very bad. 
you can't forget that, right? I mean, like it's, I think it's all too easy for us to forget that having not had a civil war in this country for so long, but just look at Syria or someplace like that and you'll realize that, yeah, that is a really bad thing. <laughs> you know, it's just the question, is it as bad as Hobbes thinks compared to the other things that can happen is, is a question. But, um, yeah, okay, so I still didn't get to talk about socialism versus private property. Maybe I will fit that in somewhere, because it is an important topic. <laughs> um, but in any case, we're out of time now, so I will see you uh, next week.